many of you might be asking, why am I doing a top 10 games video, especially when half of this year already passed? Honestly, this has been a tradition since 2014, and I enjoy celebrating great video games. Simple as that. This is all the preamble I'm gonna give ya, so let's just get straight to it. Here are my top 10 games for 2021. Every year when I make a top 10 list, there is always this obligatory indie darling that manages to crack in. This year it goes to Kenna, Bridge of Spirits. Or is it Kina? I don't know, they keep changing their pronunciation all the time throughout the dialogue. But I know what you're thinking, how is this game, with those kind of graphics, an indie game? Frankly, I ask myself that question to this day, since this game looks like on par, or even better than some AAA games. But graphics alone does not a good game make. The environments are fun to explore, and later puzzle elements feel incredibly satisfying to solve. There are some enemies that would pose a threat, and thankfully Kana has a pretty reliable staff that can give the smackdown to those awful creatures. And later on, that same staff can become a makeshift bow, which is downright awesome. And of course, I will be remiss if I don't mention the rots. Yes, they're adorable, but they can also help Kana power up her moves for devastating effect. Kana Bridge of Spirits is a charming adventure that harkens back to the classic days of 3D adventure games, and it's bound to put a smile on your face throughout its runtime. <laughs> Hi. Well, it's all right. Oh boy, Halo Infinite had quite the tumultuous history. Between development issues due to departures and that infamous 2020 reveal video featuring everyone's favorite, Craig. <laughs> this is the return to form we wanted from Halo for years now, and the shooting action is stellar. With both old and new weapons, but most importantly, the best gadget I could ever ask for. The grappling hook. I always say, if you add a grappling hook to a video game, you raise the score by at least one point. Not only it can be used to swing around or grapple to enemies, but it can be used to hijack weapons and even enemy vehicles. I always felt so vulnerable when someone was about to run me over with a ghost, but then it's like, nope, hijacked, so... Ah, it's so satisfying. The open world format might not be the most inspired since a lot of the areas look pretty similar, but from a technical perspective, there's almost no loading screen and there's just a lot to explore. I even enjoy the story this time around. Just the fact there's some new characters to inject some life and personality into the narrative makes it far more engaging. The multiplayer is also pretty fun, but I do wish it had some staying power. The progression system definitely needs some tweaking. But you know what? I trust 3 for 3 Studios. The Halo Master Chief Collection had a pretty rough launch, and they improved it significantly. Plus, we're supposed to get that co-op soon, so that's pretty cool. Halo Infinite isn't without its flaws, but at the end of the day, where it matters, the gameplay, it's incredibly fun, which makes it very easy to recommend. You have one bullet against an entire army. What can you do on your own? I told you. It's enough. Oh, so I see. Mankind knew that they cannot change society. So instead of reflecting on themselves, they blamed the beasts. Heaven or hell. 
I admit at first that Guilty Gear Strive didn't exactly scratch my fighting game itch. It mostly gave me a sense of deja vu with Guilty Gear X Zard that came out seven years prior. Strive looks better for sure, but the wow factor has definitely waned. Not to mention returning to the non-interactive story mode was a disappointment for me. Seems like a feature more suited for a streaming service than a high-paced fighting game. But despite all that, once I actually sat down and learned the new mechanics, I started to have fun. Guilty Gear Strive is the most accessible the series has ever been. Thanks to the new Gatling combo system, string moves together is much easier than before. There is also a good tutorial system explaining all the nitty gritty stuff. Even Roman cancels. I've been playing this series for over 20 years and I finally understand what Roman cancels are. The fact that Strive manages to turn a niche series into a mainstream phenomenon is a testament to its success. The cast of characters is great, it looks amazing, especially in motion, and the soundtrack is an absolute banger. Overall, when it comes to Guilty Gear Strive, this game is absolute heaven. And gentlemen, this is the biggest curveball I'm ever gonna have in my lists ever. There are two things I know nothing about. Cars and sports. Especially sports. But as for cars, all I know is that, well, they can take you from point A to B. So I've avoided the realistic car racing genre for the longest time. Until I started playing the Forza Horizon series. The series taught me that no matter my ineptitude with automobiles, it's just fun to race around in an open area, and Forza Horizon 5 is the apex of the franchise. I just had a blast exploring this vast world. The beautiful landscapes of Mexico are just jaw-dropping. Absolutely one of the best-looking games I've seen in years. And that's what makes Forza Horizon 5 work. The sense of freedom of not just being able to go anywhere, but doing it the way you, the player, want. I know zilch about tuning a vehicle, but if you put me in a jeep and I have to drive down a volcano, I'm still gonna have a smile on my face. I also can't believe I'm saying this, but there's a decent story mode here too, and your player character has dialogue. Heck, the game even calls you by your name. That's so cool. Please give it up for Daniel. Look, 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 look. I know this isn't a game that you, person who watching this channel, who normally play. I get it. But if you need to have just one realistic racer in your whole life, make it this one because it's the only one where you can customize your horn to sound like this. For Guardians of the Galaxy was definitely low, and who can blame anyone? After the failure that was Marvel's Avengers and the reveal trailer at E3, no one expected Square Enix to deliver another good Marvel game, and yeah, they didn't. Because they delivered a great Marvel game. Okay, but why is it great? I mean, it's probably just gonna copy the MCU movies, right? Well, here's the thing, it does take cue from the James Gunn movies, but thanks to the fantastic acting and excellent writing, these Guardians can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the big boys and maybe even trump them too. In addition to the gripping narrative, the soundtrack is just downright perfect. Obviously, if you know Star-Lord, you know his love for old-school rock, and I would love to play those tunes, but I don't want to get copyrighted on YouTube. I will say this, though. Whenever you see the Guardians huddle together to do one of their special team attacks, 
The music just adds more to that moment, and no matter how many times I use this, it never gets old. And yeah, some people would complain, why is Peter Quill the only playable character? But I would rather have one character that plays pretty well to a bunch of characters that are not fleshed out. And the combat in Guardians, while not amazing, is pretty fun. I like controlling Star-Lord and also giving orders to my fellow Guardians to perform special attacks. It is also an unreported story that the art direction in this game is downright gorgeous. Man, the planets you get to explore are just downright beautiful. The art team deserves a lot of credit here. I don't want to talk about this game so much because I think this is something you have to experience yourself. Give Guardians of the Galaxy a shot and you may also get hooked on a feeling. <laughs> So we finally meet. 2021 was the year where gamers found out they've been harboring a fetish. But Lady Dimitrescu aside, and trust me, it's very hard for me to set her aside, Resident Evil 8 Village is sort of a greatest hits version of Capcom's horror franchise, taking elements from many of its predecessors, such as the first person perspective of 7, the combat upgrades of 4, and even some of the more quiet horror segments from the originals. While this random mishmash of ideas may have been subject to criticism, I absolutely enjoyed my time with it. I mostly heard how 8 is a downgrade from 7 due to the emphasis on action over horror, but this is the main reason why I prefer this game. The combat just feels quicker, less clunky, and the ability to upgrade every weapon makes every encounter a joy. However, this isn't Resi 5 or 6 where you're overpowered, enemies can still pose a threat and ammo is still scarce. But this is also part of the fun, how you can optimize your encounter by rummaging the environment or maybe luring enemies to an explosive trap. Each of the bosses of the game have their own area with its own unique atmosphere, from the creepy marionettes of House Beneviento to the classic Dimitres castle which draws a lot of inspiration from the Spencer Mansion. I do admit the game does lose a bit of focus towards the end unfortunately, but up until that point, and you will know exactly what point I'm talking about, it's one crazy ride. Plus it will teach you things about yourself that you didn't know before. Why do I have a sudden craving for milk? Oh, be careful what you wish for, Ethan Winters. <laughs> My name starts with a D is Rasputin. 2021 would be remembered as the year in which I played catch up with a bunch of franchises. One of them was 2005's Psychonauts. I have no idea why it took me so long to play this because man, this game is spectacular. The graphics, the story, the voice work, just everything is just splendid. I just wish I did not play the PlayStation version, huh? My point is that I wasn't one of those people who had to wait 16 agonizing years for a Psychonauts sequel. But even without the excruciating wait, Psychonauts 2's arrival was still wonderful. Despite such a long release gap, Tim Schafer and his team at Double Fine did not miss a beat. The game's look, while modernized, still retains a lot of the surreal visuals from both its characters and locations. Just the sheer amount of creativity on display is awe-inspiring. And man, the levels you get to explore are some of the most creative things I've seen in gaming, period. You get a dental ward filled with teeth and gums for walls, a hospital-inspired casino, and even a cooking game show run by puppets, which is honestly a personal favorite of mine. The whole story is absolutely excellent. Though it does have a more serious tone than the last game, the humor is still intact, and boy, it really is intact. 
Where'd you learn how to make pancakes? Prison. The gameplay has seen significant improvement. Jumping and levitating is much easier to do, and many powers like pyrokinesis can be performed while moving and in tandem with others. I am extremely happy that Psychonauts 2 exists. The original did not exceed Cell's expectations, and even the sequel needed significant fundings before being greenlit. On top of that, just living through the hype that was bubbling for so long is quite an achievement. If you never play this series, trust me, it will blow your mind. Maybe we should focus on what you two have in common. Like, do you guys like pizza? Oh yeah. Me? Me too. Well, that's amazing. I had no idea dragons liked pizza. Great. That was terrific. Yeah, great. Change the channel. Uh, but the man said to stay tuned. This year marks the 20th anniversary of the Ratchet & Clank franchise. And while I do consider myself a fan, I admit that I fell off at a certain point. I know Up Your Arsenals is many's favorite game, but even back then I just didn't feel it had the same highs of going commando. So, in preparation for the next game, I binged every single mainline game up until now. Why am I bringing this up? Well, in my opinion, Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart is the best Ratchet & Clank game we got since the PlayStation 2 era. Let's get one aspect right out of the gate. This is the most beautiful game I've ever played in my life. The first time going through a portal and transporting to a whole new location without a single loading screen is draw-dropping from both a technical and artistic standpoint. The story doesn't dwell on the whole chosen one aspect that I did not like much in the future saga and focuses instead on newcomers Rivet and Kit. Kit in particular is actually one of my favorite new characters in the franchise. The gunplay has been the best it has ever been in the series. Maybe the weapons themselves aren't the most unique, but they're still incredibly fun to use, not to mention that the enemy AI will definitely keep you on your toes. Thankfully, avoiding enemy attacks have become very easy to use thanks to the new Quick Dash, which might be the best new addition the series has ever had since its inception. On a more superficial angle, I do admit I love using the Rift Tether to just teleport me to a different area so I don't get destroyed by the enemies. If you've never played a Ratchet & Clank game or have fallen off the series like myself over the years, Rift Apart is the return to form we've all been waiting for. A must own for any PS5 owner. This is Transwalt Snowboarding. Now you're probably wondering what is this game doing on this video? Well, it was actually made by Housemark, and from their humble beginnings, they made one of the best games of last year, Returnal. The best way for me to describe Returnal is, take a third-person shooter and combine it with elements of roguelites and bullet hell shooters. Yep, you heard me right. The game is definitely punishing, appropriate to a roguelite game, but the more you go through the game, the better you get, and the action is so fun and the areas are so expensive and interesting to explore, you just want to keep going. And you don't lose everything when you die, you do get to keep some awesome tools, like a hookshot. And you know what I think about those already. I also appreciate how the story contextualized resurrecting over and over again, especially at the midway point of the story, where there is this gut-wrenching twist that made me really sad, which I wasn't expecting. I like to keep this entry a little bit on the shorter side, because a lot of the intrigue with Returnal is the mystery behind it. And trust me, the less you know, the more exciting this adventure will be. Returnal might be tough as nails, but if I keep dying over and over and I still come back to it, it must be doing something right.
I have a confession to make. When Metroid Dread was announced last year, I didn't freak out like most people did. It's not because I didn't care, it's just I was barely a Metroid fan. The only games I played were Prime 1, 2, and a little bit of Zero Mission. But I decided that 2021 was gonna be the year in which I'm gonna play every single 2D Metroid before the release of Dread. In fact, I actually streamed some of them on my Twitch channel and, well, a lot of laughs were had. At my expense. If I mess this part up, I have to do the whole thing again, so... Just take it slow. There we go. One, two, there we go. Ah! No! Son of my mother, why? <laughs> Son of my mother, why? No! Needless to say, these games are amazing, and there's a reason why Metroidvania as a subgenre took off. So when I finally got to play Dread, after the insurmountable expectations I had after finally completing those games, did Metroid Dread live up to them? Well, it is number one on this list now, isn't it? Metroid Dread takes all the elements from the previous games, especially Samus Returns, and further refines them. Every single action from running, jumping, shooting, all just flows perfectly together in such beautiful synergy. A great example would be the new polish countering mechanic. I like the way the mechanic was handled in Samus Returns, where you had to stop in place. In Metroid Dread, you can do the counter while you're moving, so not only it's more efficient and easy to pull off, it does not break the pace and keeps the momentum of both the combat and the movement going. The game features the best bosses, at least in the 2D Metroid games. They're all unique and, just like the rest of the game, can be quite challenging, but it is incredibly fulfilling to use all the tools you learn throughout the game to defeat them. And if you manage to be really good at the countering mechanic, oh boy, the beatdown that Samus dishes is priceless. Just look at this! How can you not love this? This is just insane! It's just a feast for the eyes! I know I don't really have a lot of Nintendo titles on my top 10 lists as of late, but at least the one Nintendo game that made it managed to reach the top spot. And that is why Metroid Dread is my favorite game of 2021. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in my top 10 games of 2022, probably in 2024.